Hey, everybody. This is Melissa McKenzie, publisher of The American Spectator. Join again and always with Scott McKay, contributing editor of The American Spectator, and of course, his own stuff at Reviver. And, and a book. And, and a book. the book. Are you still doing a book. Hey, this a high, hey, Manifesto right. Manifesto is a great book. Outstanding <laughs> book. Get it on Amazon. Does Is the Hayride a thing still? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so the Hayride too. So he's yeah. our Louisiana um, connection. He knows everything about Louisiana, as we've talked about before. And we were talking off camera, and now we're talking on camera about the Grammys, which I didn't watch because I don't care. Um, but I did see Sam Smith bloated self in a his red pajamas and acting That's like Satan. Fat Satan. Yeah, That's fat what this Satan. guy is. Yeah, I thought the Babylon Bee had a funny headline about that saying that Satan is distancing himself from <laughs> Sam Smith or something. I don't know. I was just like, uh, and I don't like well, Sam, Sam Smith anyway, so this was par for the course. But. Well, I mean, this is, look, okay, you know, and I'll just say this to get started. I mean, they're trying to make Sam Smith like the alpha male of the, you know, gay slash trans slash alphabet community in the record business. Mm -hmm. And that's bad casting because Sam Smith is not an alpha male of any like stripe whatsoever. I mean, this guy is a soft, pudgy loser. Okay. That's what he is. Now he means he's gay. He says he's non-binary, which that right there tells you what a beta this guy is. Mm -hmm. Like you can't even decide, right? Um, but you know, they did this whole thing and they like they and look, I didn't watch the Grammys either, but I did get subjected to the video of this atrocious performance that headlined the thing. Uh -huh. Um, and just in case you're one of the like few people who hasn't been subjected to this, I'll just give you like a brief synopsis. First of all, they bring out the remnants of Madonna, okay? Because, uh -huh. uh, and, and I'll just say this. So Madonna uh, is obviously a fairly talented businesswoman. Um, although I wouldn't say she's like a genius businesswoman. She's like reasonably talented. At one point in her life, she was um, certainly a fashion style symbol, okay? Uh, but never really capitalized on that. Um, and instead, what Madonna chose to do with her career and her sort of celebrity identity was she wanted to be a sex symbol. She, has a dance, she, has a, she had a dancer's body. She had a dancer's body. And, yeah. you know, like that was, you know, that was mm -hmm. sort of the, the, the nexus and core of her act. Mm -hmm. But that's never going to last you forever, right? Like when you hit 45, 50 you're going to have to morph into something else. Madonna never did that. They right. had, I can't for the life of it, like they were caricatures of like U S senators and stuff. And right, they right. show back in like the early nineties. She looks like one of those. Okay. I mean, like it's not a human face anymore that Madonna has. Yeah. Um, and they bring her out. And of course her photographs of her that make it to the internet or social media are, are like carefully curated and photoshopped by a staff of people that she has. So this was the first time a lot of people had seen what Madonna really looks like now in, you know, what, 10 years or something. And mm -hmm. so like, everybody's like, what is that? I mean, like it was awful. And she comes out and she starts, oh, well, you know, um, basically like it's pay in tribute to the rebels and the people that don't mind starting a controversy and yada, yada, yada. Right. And so she does that. And then they bring out Sam Smith and like Kim, what's Kim, Kim uh, Fedress or something. I can't remember what the. I, I've the never heard of this person. German before. kid who had a sex change operation at 16 years old and mm -hmm. is now a, you know, quasi female mm -hmm. pop singer. Okay. And they have this song called Unholy. And I actually. I mean, I heard it once. I'm like, okay, this is a entirely forgettable right. pop song. All right. And then I looked at the lyrics and it's like kind of the story of, you know, kind of the horny dad who goes to strip club, basically. Ew. It's, yeah, it's, it's a nothing. And the lyrics are, 
um, like we, I was on another podcast earlier today. And we were actually talking about this, and um, um, I get to give a guy a little uh, a, a little plug. Steve Hook, who if you haven't heard him, he's on TNT Radio, and Steve's fantastic, good friend of mine. And he's like, you know, pop music is is going to get overtaken by AI right? Like, because like AI is, you know, can produce the entire thing. You don't even need a band or human beings anymore. And I'm like, well, um, I've seen chat GPT and I'm not impressed, but I can say this looking at the lyrics for unholy right, they chat GPT it. could do that work. Okay. Like it's that stupid and meaningless. I mean, they're like dumb lyrics. Um, and anyway, so, so to sell this at the Grammys, they put everybody in red. Sam Smith's out here in like a Satan costume with a with a top hat that has horns coming out, and he's wearing high heeled boots. Is it like you're gonna make Sam Smith a sex symbol? It's freaking retarded. Anyway, um, and then you know Kim, whatever uh, tranny Kim is in in a cage, and they're they're doing this song and there's fire and they got like girls in bondage stuff and, we're, and it's like. I'm watching it and I'm going, okay, I'm not shocked because this is kind of all Hollywood does anymore. So there's that. Mm -hmm. I'm not impressed because it's a crappy song. Um, the satanic stuff doesn't actually um, relate to what the song is. I mean, if they did this song and it was a strip club, that would actually, well, no, no, this is the song. This is like, no, no, we're just doing this for one reason and one reason only, which is to shock people, okay? And why do you have to shock people? Because the song sucks. It's not good. There's nothing beautiful or true or meaningful in the song. It, it's just, a, it's a crappy song that somebody, some you know corporate bigwig somewhere decided they want to feature that at the Grammys. And it was like, you know, this isn't going to impress anybody. So now we've got to dress it up some. And this is what they came up with, which is, hey, let's do a satanic ritual and it's going to piss off all the Christians and, you know, give us some uh, some notoriety around this and sort of resurrect some buzz around the Grammys. And the reason they had to do that was because in 2020, the Grammys uh, television audience dropped below 20 million for the first time ever, went to like 17 million. And this was like, oh, my God, this is like a terrible, terrible thing. Well, in 21 and 22, the Grammys had like 8 million viewers. So they got it up to 12 million. And they're like, hey, this is kind of on the upswing. And it's like, it's the third worst show you've ever had. And you're bragging about it, which should tell you how in the tank pop music is. Now, having said that, and I wrote about this um, in uh, recording this on Tuesday, today's American Spectator has my piece on it. And like, basically what I said is, you know, this is not necessary if your song doesn't suck. I mean, I, you may have heard of him, you guys in the audience, you may have heard of Larry Fleet, country singer, okay? Here's a guy who can come out with a guitar and do an acoustic set, blow your mind. He sings a song that you may have heard called Where I Find God, which the lyrics are so beautiful and so like they so ring true song blew up and this guy was pouring concrete not long ago he got found because he did he was doing facebook lives basically concerts in his in his basement where he would just put the camera on and had him him and his guitar and like people would come on the chat thing and say you know play you know conway twitty and he would go and do that um, and then, you know, people kind of approached him and said, man, you're really good. Can, you know, can we write a song? And there was this woman that, you know, was a songwriter in Nashville, approached Larry Fleet and said, hey, let's write a song together. The song was Where I Find God. And now he's on his way and, you know, he's doing the whole thing. Point is, I mean, Sam Smith wasn't, you know, a, some garage band that somebody found. That guy was, I mean, like he was built by the record industry hey, this guy's got a good voice, whatever. And so we're going to make him into this personality. All right. And, you know, the guy doesn't, I mean, he's, I mean, he's non-binary. He has no idea. Does he like guys? Does he like girls? Like he, this guy doesn't even know. All right. I look at a guy who was pouring concrete four or five years ago, 
who has real talent and you will never see Larry Fleet on the stage at some award show wearing high heel boots and a horn hat um, with BDSM dancers, you know, running around him. Uh, I mean, you, you would never see that. And you, that guy could show up, plop down on a stool and, you know, belt out his song just in an acoustic set. And everybody in that audience would be, you know, jaw on the floor. And the thing about it is that's brave. They talk about Sam Smith and Sam Smith is brave. Bullshit. That's, there's nothing brave. Everybody stood up and cheered because they were, oh, this was so wonderful. And it's like a satanic ritual because that's what Hollywood is. Put some country singer on a stool in an acoustic set with none of the, you know, fire in the background or any of that kind of stuff and just let the music speak, that's brave because nobody over there knows how to do that anymore. And yet- What do you think, well, Scott, what do you think about the, um, I, I'm kind of torn because on the one hand, I think Sam Smith is a no talent ass clown. I hate his voice. I hate that like there's something wrong with his Everything soft and hard palate, whatever soft. it is. Soft I, I, is the word. Yeah. I don't like his voice. Okay, so that that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate the guts it takes to you know put your art out there. Okay, good for him, whatever. But I, I'm kind of torn between he was a clown and dressed up as a clown at the Grammys, and Actually, that was Harry Styles who was a clown and dressed up as a clown, like literally what? as a clown. Well, okay, that's nice for. I mean, Harry can pull pretty much anything off because of who he is, but. I'm just saying that, so I'm torn between that with Sam Smith and the fact that Sam Smith does represent Hollywood now. He represents oh, the music industry. Question. And the the thing is, is that I feel like there's just this kind of, you know, overt, you know, screw you God type of attitude and daring anybody to say anything about it. Yeah. And in a weird kind of, psychologically, it's interesting an acknowledgement that what they're doing and who they are are satanic. All oh, of the people, uh, all the people up there with him who were, you know, in drag and doing everything that they were doing, somehow on some level knows that they're not agents of God. They're agents of Satan. Yeah. And, and they're just overt about it. And in some way, kind of slavishly stupid because you know, there's no nothing clever or even now it's just like, you know what, America, screw you. We're going to be um, there's nothing you can say about it. We're just going to be straight up evil and embrace it. I don't know. There's just something weirdly um, open about it that t belies like a complete disrespect for themselves and for the values of just the average person watching. It's just kind of insulting. Let me read you something. This is uh, from a friend of mine, uh, Allison Collins Acosta, who is a uh, singer here in Baton Rouge, um, who like when she's my, almost my age, a little younger than me, like when I was in my 20s, Allison Collins was the hottest thing around. OK, and then she's like, what are these like, hey, whatever happened to her? Like, you know, I thought she was like, mm. I'm going to I'm going to read you. Uh, this thing, let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, because uh, she actually, as a reaction to this whole, uh, this whole deal, uh, this is what she posted. Uh, my original music career was put on hold when I was 23 because I got pregnant. I almost got an abortion, but in the middle of Wendy's on College Drive, the Lord supernaturally moved on my heart. And he said to me, this baby is my gift to you. Have your baby. I immediately had peace and joy and knew that everything was going to be okay. And I had my baby girl fast forward to age 26. I'm finishing up an original album that I wrote on my own. I have an artist development contract with MCA records. A tour is in the works. The stars are lining up and I hear the Lord tell me, I want you to give it all up. And I did. And it wasn't hard to do because Jesus had been lavishing me with his presence and giving me dreams that were so powerful. I'd wake up out of breath. I didn't care about fame or fortune anymore. I wanted more of him. I didn't watch the Grammys last night, but I heard enough about him and saw some clips. I have to say, I've never been more thankful that the Lord protected me from all that wickedness. I'm so thankful he gave me a solid foundation to build my life upon. 
The narrow way hasn't been easy, but the older I get, the more I realize it's so worth it. I know the Lord isn't finished with me, but if he never does a single thing for me again, I'm satisfied. I'm fulfilled. I have shalom. Lord, I'm not ashamed to shout to the world how good and faithful you are. Jesus, I love you. How awesome is that? Wow. Well, right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and like contrast that with, I mean, this is somebody who Allison has talent. Like she's a really good singer and could very easily have been somebody that was mm. on that stage at some point. And instead, you know, I mean, she sings at, you know, weddings and what, like whatever. I mean, she still sings, like she still has the joy of, of that right. profession and doing that, but like the fame and fortune she never got, she's totally cool with it. Because seeing what you have to do yeah. to get the Grammys, nobody as a person of faith can can you know can go that route without knowing what they're sacrificing to get there. Um, and and I think Sunday night was the perfect example of that. Like, look, this is, and I mean, it's an old trope, right? It's the make your deal with the devil. It goes all mm -hmm. the way back to you know Robert Johnson at the crossroads, right? Mm -hmm. And but it's it's you know not necessarily literally a real thing, but figuratively, metaphorically, spiritually, it is a real thing because what you saw at the Grammys on Sunday was what that business is. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like in previous podcasts, we've talked about Britney Spears and we've talked mm -hmm. about like, you know, what, what that business does to people. And yeah. here's the thing. Um, you don't need that to have a career in music now. People are finding it through, you know, social media, through YouTube, through all these different mm -hmm. things. And it's a matter of time before there's a homegrown alternative to the sort of Hollywood recording industry. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, to me, I can't I, I'm expecting at some point bands will start selling subscriptions to, you know, an app right. um, and, you know, right. a buck a month or whatever. And you get access to all of the content. Or maybe people will share stuff between, you know, different band apps and things like that. And, you know, and make your money that way. And it's yours. And it doesn't go through one of these satanic record labels um, that corrupts everybody. Like that's the technology is there. The market is, is certainly developing. And at some point, the Grammys and all that stuff, that's going to get left in the dust because mm -hmm. it deserves it. There's no value there. There's no, there's certainly no God there. There's no, there's no truth or beauty in it. It's mm -hmm. over. And that's the reason that these guys are, are like get more and more disgusting every year at their annual spectacle, trying to recapture an audience that they will never recapture. And I, I think, think it's a great thing, actually. I guess at the end of the Grammys, a rapper um, rapped about God. And yeah. someone said, you know, it's interesting that we're focusing, you know, on Sam Smith and Satan when, um, you know, God was also talked about today. And so I do think it's, it's a strange thing. Like everything else, I feel like the, the culture is, um, ironically enough, binary, you're having to choose which you know, which way you're going. And, and it's really, really getting more clear. And so I, I don't know what to think about this. I, I just feel like uh, the people are really degrading themselves. I, I, I'm just not sure if we can come back from this. Like, I don't know, like, for example, this is, we didn't talk about this before, but I, I, this has been on my mind all day. I saw um, research that had been done at the University of Wisconsin about free speech. I don't know if you saw it or not. Um, and so I'm sorry for springing this on you, but I'll just talk about it a bit because the findings were just horrifying. But as you imagine, the more conservative that you got, the less likely you felt free to speak in class. You certainly didn't want your professors to know. No so that's nothing new. Um, but the um, what was amazing, conversely, was the number, the percentage of young people who thought it was a good thing to rat out a former uh, uh, a 
a friend, colleague, student, if they said something wrong. And the further left they went, the more okay they were with basically tattling on uh, fellow students, professors, whatever, because the they were afraid that the speech might have made someone uncomfortable. Yeah. The least likely to do this were white heterosexual males, big shock, and conservative Christians generally, mm -hmm. and conservatives. You know, the more conservative, the less totalitarian. Right. And, but the thing that bothered me was even among um, the heterosexual men, it was still a minority. Um, and I think it was 38%. It was like something 60, 40 in some, you know, to break it down generally. But the majority still felt like free speech wasn't that big of a deal and not worth thinking or talking about. Right. So uh, a, a, no, no one, um, the vast majority, and it was even higher than that, amongst women amongst you know um you know the alphabet people <laughs> they the the further they the further you go left the more they wanted to censor their anyone they disagree with or they wanted um they didn't think free speech mattered people's feelings mattered more to them like their own hurt feelings mattered more than free speech uh, I don't know how we continue uh, uh, going down this road. Like, I don't know. I mean, well, they, th this was of the all of the Wisconsin campuses in, in the state. Well, OK, so I don't want to minimize this because it is it's a it's a, a, a thing. But in my own college experience, um, like I have a story that I can kind of throw into the mix here that I think might explain some of it. And mm -hmm. why it's not as catastrophic as it might seem. Okay. So um, uh, my degree is from LSU, but I went to SMU in Dallas for the first three years of college. For the first uh, three? What's that? First three, for yeah. First three? And then you, yeah. you graduated at the party school? Finished at LSU, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, SMU, SMU didn't take a backseat to anybody <laughs> the party school thing at all um but anyway and you know, i could give you my entire curriculum vitae and i'm not going to do it but um i was in like the honors program at smu my freshman year and the honors like curriculum there your freshman year is it was like this new age different thing they did you didn't have like an english class your first year it was like a humanities class and basically what it was is like a survey of all the cultures around the world right and you know you're not allowed to say that any culture is better than another they're different but they're not better and don't you say mm -hmm. they are that whole thing mm -hmm. right and so it was i mean this was like woke before anybody knew what woke was i mean it was a it was basically a cultural marxism right you know, smorgasbord that they subjected us to and you can't get a more conservative campus than smu and they still ran wild with this stuff yeah um so, you know, and I mean, the school is like, you know, the, this whole program is 60% or more Greek. Okay. I mean, it's all a bunch of like, you know, Republican kids and, you know, like everybody went along with it. Nobody, like nobody protested any of this stuff. And there was a reason why, which was, we're not here to learn any of this shit. We're mm -hmm. here to make contacts with people that are going to help us in business we're here to get the best grade we can mm -hmm. when class is over, like we'll do what work we have to do to like get an A or a B. Mm -hmm. And then we're not going to think about any of this stuff at all. Right. Cause there's mm -hmm. a keg party coming or widespread panic is playing downtown or what, like, you know, you're in Dallas, there's things to do. I mean, this is like, I'm here cause I have to be, and I'm going to go through the motions and move on. And it was everybody. And I mean, I'm 18, I'm 19. I'm along with the crowd. If you'd have put me back in there 10 years later, I'd have beat somebody. Okay. <laughs> right, I right. mean, like, but they're, you know, they're college kids and they are literally like, I'm not going to rock the boat here. I'm just going to tell this idiot what he wants me to say. Okay. Right. Get my grade and then I'm gone. All right. 
And I, I think there's a whole lot of that on these college campuses. And mm -hmm. it's one of the, re like, in other words, you know, like the left kind of built this template of, no, you, these college kids are full of vim and vigor and passion. And we have to, you know, we have to make use of that. And we have to, you know, we look. They, uh, it it might have won them the last election, though. I don't know. I maybe, think it's but, getting I, more like radicalized. What I'm, what I'm saying is, um, other than like the kids that go to Liberty and Hillsdale and I need that piece of paper, I'm going to get it. I don't care what I have to do to get it. It's not going to kill me. These people don't own me. They're not going to control the rest of my life. Yeah, 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 whatever. Sure, I'll tell you, know, I'll use your pronouns. And, whatever. and they get out of that school and they leave it. Like if you ever read Andrew Breitbart's book, um, righteous indignation. He tells the whole story of Tulane, right? Because he went to Tulane and, you know, he wasn't politically aware or awake at all the whole time he was a guy. Like, basically, so, his, I think till his senior year and then he started kind of semi paying attention and getting ticked off. Right. But I mean, like his whole thing is he went to Tulane to like drink and do drugs. Right. Like that's what that's what he went to college for. And like part of what he says in the book is probably a good thing right because if right. i actually paid attention these people would have ruined me right right uh, and turned me into one of these woke leftists but like he was just he kind of, he was kind of unmoved by college because he was in new orleans and there was things to do and it's like so anyway the point is um the kids that are going to become the republican voters in their 20s much less the you know 30s and 40s and the ones that where life experience makes them Republican, those are not going to be the political activists in college. You right. cannot balance out the left's, you know, armies of, of stupid kids that have been, you know, woke indoctrinated. Ours are like, yeah, 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 whatever, because they know where the keg party is, okay? And people don't really want to talk po politics at the keg party, right? They want to talk sports and getting laid and doing all these, you know, Things that to an 18, 19, 20 year old are way more consequential than freaking politics. All right. And that's never really going to change. And in fact, the uh, mm -hmm. the, well, but the people who are the big conservative activists in college, okay, like the student government people and what, like those are the ones that turn into these awful political consultants. And it's like <laughs> well, GOP. No, I'm not kidding. Because I mean, I, I I could tell you start probably piss off some people even going there. But like, those are the people who are the party infighters and the and the people who rush to join the establishment and become part of the problem, right? Because they start in that game early. Like they get a job working for a congressman or a presidential campaign or whatever when they're in school, and then they move up and they're in the the you know the 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 party institutions. And never really, you know, get a real job or like real experience and have that perspective. And that like they get right into the pipeline and the next thing you know, you know, they're Capitol Hill staffers or they're like getting jobs working for different things. And they're in the government, you know, media complex as pet Republicans or whatever. And like these guys have no idea what regular Americans or what Republican voters or conservatives that like are sick of the GOP and won't even register Republican, like they don't identify with those people at all. So I don't know how good a thing it is to like get this massive amount of college age Republican activists. I would much rather get recruit people who have had like a life and like experienced getting screwed over by the government because those guys are ready. Um, I don't know how many college kids are. I mean, yeah, okay. They, they shut down your free speech when you're in English class and that sucks. And you might remember that, but you're not going to radicalize those kids for that because it doesn't mean that much to them at the end of the day. I don't know. I, I'm going to disagree with you. I think, and well, maybe good. we should have some disagreement on this show once in a while. Yeah, well, I'm disagreeing with you now. And I think it's because I have had three kids grow up in the system. And I see the um, people, the young people, there's a certain cultural thing. And, it, and it's not just political, it's cultural and how parents are raising their kids. There's that. that. That every child's 
you know, every thought and opinion is divine inspiration. You know, God consults their children for an opinion. There's a real difference in the culture amongst younger people than there was even of our generation. I think what you're describing too, by the way, for those of you watching, if you have not read Andrew's book, Righteous Indignation, it's a must it, read. Is, it is a must read. And it is because, first of all, he's a beautiful writer and he wrote it himself, yeah. uh, much to the heartburn of a lot of us who were helping him. Um, because <laughs> getting him to finish it and you sit down and write it, but he's a phenomenal writer. It is a beautiful book. Yeah, the, the prose of that book will, even if you don't agree with the things he's saying, the prose will keep you going because it's, it's it's funny, it's passionate. I mean, like yes. it's exactly what you want out of a nonfiction book. And yes. I've read it twice. Just yeah, it's a great the second book. time I read it because it was just such a fun read the first time. Yes. And so anyway, but like, I do think that that kind of vibe, you know, and I don't know how old you are, but Andrew and I are close in age and, and there's that generation where we, I wasn't even really political and in, in college, I didn't even pay attention. I didn't care. But I think that because things are so radicalized on campuses now that a, well, it was always the small percentage of the weirdos who were in, interested in politics. I think now things are you know when you have these leftists um disrupting speeches and college campuses from different various thinkers who are pretty mainstream and okay. not even that extreme or anything like just regular yeah, scholars I mean, Douglas Murray and Heather McDonald I mean you like, how do you even know who Douglas Murray is you're a sophomore in college like what, right. like what is that right right so like i think that there's just kind of a a um different attitude and we where they're shutting out with the help of the administration mm -hmm. thoughts and ideas that they disagree with and will consider them like it's just language is hurtful that you know hurtful yeah. hurtful language well it's not hurtful you disagree with it and you're a big fat baby and well, somebody yeah. needs to tell these kids that but it's not and so like um it's this real touchy feely kind of vibe that I frankly tire of, you know, well, as you should. I found out my kids were like, you know, that, you know, I don't feel safe when you talk like that. I, I think I beat them. I, I, I've never I, beaten know. them in my life, but that might do it. You know, I'm just like, God help my kids when they, when they finally when they have some it's like, Oh, I don't feel safe. It's like, Oh, let me show you unsafe. <laughs> I'm gonna dangle you from a bridge and then you'll have a true appreciation of, of what you're talking about. Um, well, okay, and but and, and I I don't disagree with anything you say. I would point out that this is a factor in the dwindling number of kids who are going to college. Wow. Well, okay, true. this this accounts for the explosion in kids going to trade school. Yeah. Because if you're not there for a specific, you know, engineering or, you know, right. business or pre-med or what, like whatever, then, you know, if you just, you don't really know what your major, you should go to, you know, Votex school and get like Microsoft certified. And then you can make 65 grand a year at your, at 20 years old. And right. why on earth would you go to, you know, you go to college later, you can do it online or what, and lots and lots and lots of people are doing it. Because college is such a hassle for normal, you know, or normies, right? The cisgender, you know, whatever the hell they call it these days. If you're normal, and I wrote this a couple of years ago at The Spectator, it was like, what is, what is it a straight white kid would get out of college? Right. I mean, like, if you don't have, like, a, you know, I'm going engineering, or like, why on earth would you go to college? They don't want you there. Like right. you just like, you know, like when I tell you your credit card is declined <laughs> because I came to fix your pipes and you're like, oh, and it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. okay. How, how much good is that college degree that you're $250,000 in debt now, right? Right. And I mean, that story is playing out a lot across the country. Yes. Um, and I think it's only going to play out more. And the thing of it is, is that so many of these colleges are kind of, like the, the administration is kind of protected 
from the consequences of this, like they've got big endowments. So if the enrollment drops, it's not a tragedy, right? Right. Um, you know, and so it, it's going to take a while for this to fully unwind, but fully unwind it will, unless Republicans are so stupid in positions of whether it's Congress or state legislatures or so forth, like stop paying for this, let it die. I mean, really, like, Colleges going bankrupt is not a bad thing because a left wing crappy college that goes bankrupt can be bought up cheap and turned into a right wing excellent college. <laughs> um, and I, like a good example of this is what's being done at the new college of the University of South Florida. So and I don't like if you guys aren't aware of what's going on, this is the this is the college that Ron DeSantis but like Christopher Rufo and these other guys on the board. And the deal is you probably like never even heard of the new college. This is the deal on this is university of South Florida is the big, like giant big public school in Tampa. It's like 55, 60,000 students in the early seventies. I think it was, they, they put like a satellite campus of USF in Sarasota, which is like caddy corner across Tampa Bay on the South side. Um, on the Gulf of Mexico. They, they built this, you know, really neat kind of avant-garde sort of, you know, they called it the new college at the University of South Florida. And it was, you know, supposed to be like, you know, I think initially the, the plan was, it's going to be a real sort of Socratic classical learning type environment for all these kids. And it got a pretty good academic reputation, like really fast. And then it went totally woke. And now like the enrollment has cratered and the place is a zoo. So DeSantis is like, you know what? I'm going to go find like five or six of the most rabid, you know, conservative activists in higher education that I can find. And I'm going to put, put them all on the board. And so like, you know, the, the, the best known one, the one that we know really well is Christopher Rufo, who has written like treatises upon treatises about woke higher education and how awful it is and whatever. And he's, you know, you know who Christopher Rufo is. I mean, the guy is, is he's fantastic on all of these cultural Marxism issues. So anyway, they put these guys on the board. And I mean, they're going to probably have to reboot that college altogether because yeah. the first meeting they had was a zoo and there's people yelling and screaming or whatever. And, you know, like they, they tried to cancel the meeting. Like, oh no, everybody. The administration tried to cancel the meeting. Right. That's the yeah, thing. It the it's like, it's like, no, we're the board and you can't cancel us. Who the hell do you think you are? Right. Like it was one of those kind of things. Um, but you know, they're gradually starting to, you know, make mm -hmm. progress and I mean, this place has bottomed out. So it's like, they got nothing to lose. I mean, like if all of the students left, it probably would be a good thing. Right? <laughs> it's almost like, you know, like an athletic program rebuilding. And it's like, let's clean out the roster. Um, you know, like the, the funny story that's Deion Sanders is the new football coach at the University of Colorado. And there was like this big hue and cry because his first meeting with the team, he's like, he looks around the room, he says, yeah, most of y'all should go in the transfer portal because y'all were one and eleven this year, <laughs> and I'm getting better <laughs> players in here right now, right? Like, so yeah, you better <laughs> just go. Like, I don't, I don't care how many of you leave. Like, I, I, I want you gone. And they're like, "Oh, you can't say that." He's like, "They went one and eleven. I can absolutely say it. I'm not coaching these, these kids are clowns." So, in other words, like, I think that may work in an academic sense too, right? And we're going to find out at the new college of the University of South Florida with these guys coming in. And like, you know, they're going to clean this place out and this is faculty and whatever. And probably most of them are going to go because they're, you know, like the, the goal is to you know, build a little Hillsdale over here. Like Hillsdale. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that the, the, it, the opportunity is ripe and it's just an abomination that my tax dollars, like in Texas, are going to all these, to pay these radicals. So well, it's, but it's time. Republicans that, I mean, and I say this. I know you said it last time. Here's the thing. We got to We got to change subjects now because we've been talking about this for a while and I don't want to let the balloon story go. Let's go. Let's we've got to talk about the balloon. I, so I didn't really write or say much about it because the implications of this is just so it's awful. horrifying. It's awful. No and doubt. it's like, and the fact that Biden let this thing fly across the country and then we find out, well, it might have been filled with bombs. We didn't know. And I was like, 
then that's an act of war, you moron, if if that's the truth. And then they they shoot it down over the ocean after it's already gone across. And then and then trying to float this float the story. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, you. I'm here all night. Well, um well. anyway, and talking about how um you know, the balloons were flying across the country under Trump, but that Mattis wasn't telling him or Millie wasn't telling him. And I'm like, what? Well, then that has, that's a treason that we're talking about, that the the military is actually withholding information from the president. What? Well, you, you do know that Mattis went to work for uh, uh, the Cohen Group, which is William Cohen's um, influence peddling shop. Oh, who's did he? Main, who's main, like right after he left Trump, whose mm. main client is China, mm. right? Yeah. So I don't like, and I'm not going to sit here and, and say, because I don't think the Mattis stuff is true. Like, I don't think any aspect of, of the three balloons that, oh, later we found out and we kind of deduced that these balloons, I don't, I don't think any of that's true. But um, it's plausible. John Rat well, Here, maybe here's it's plausible, a... but like John Radcliffe came out categorically said, no, that's that's right, that's right. Happened. Rick Grinnell said the same thing. I believe it's the, Radcliffe and Grinnell before right. I believe like whoever it is that's peddling this, right? Right. Um, you know, I, like the big thing these guys, oh well, you know, that balloon is that's uh, you know, they get you know, pop that balloon and it's a biological weapon and it's gonna spread virus. Right. Trust me. There are way better ways to spread viruses than the freaking balloon. We just saw it a couple of years ago. Okay. A couple guys on a plane, much better than a freaking balloon at 60,000 feet. Believe well, the thing, the thing is, is that one way or the other, no matter what, the damage has been done. Like whether they, let's just say they got no information all, which I actually think no, they got information, no, no, but no, let's no. just say that they didn't. They got and, a super important piece of information, but go ahead. Well, exactly. They they now know what kind of if they didn't they know, know from Afghanistan, if they didn't know from everything else, they've learned a tremendous amount about our military and uh, pr President Joe Biden it, and what he's willing and capable of. Was it Jed Babin at the Spectator today that made that point? I yeah, think was, I, think I don't know. I, I it, was, I, it was either Jed or it was yeah. uh, David Catrone. One of the two made that point. I actually yeah. had a spectator today saying, "Yeah, this is probably what this was." Like, oh, probably. Fly a balloon over America and let's see what they do. Right? Mm -hmm. If, if it, we shoot down a big balloon, the Chinese are like, eh. but if we don't, they know exactly who they're dealing with. They yeah. know everything about our response to something like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I mean. Which is why, here's the thing, which is why we put air bases on the Aleutian Islands, which is a place that you would never put an air base on, but, you know, for any other reason than something comes from the Pacific and you can get there first from the Aleutian Islands in a plane, right? right? So when they track this balloon coming across the Pacific from China, when it got to the Aleutian Islands, splash it in the Pacific. That's what they're there for. And nobody goes, oh, well, you know, we didn't really, we didn't think it was a big deal. It's like, oh, right. Until it flies over the Air Force Base in Montana, where we've got all of our nuclear missile silos, and for some reason slows down and stays there. Well, it did circles. I mean, the thing is, there were people who were mapping it. I saw the map of it. It was insane. And the thing is, is that like. No, it, fl it flew over like every major <laughs> installation. Right. Yeah, like across, you know, from northwest to southeast, and you're sitting there going, and so then that seriously, leads me we're gonna do nothing, right? That leads me to the question then, did was Biden okay with this? Is that why Biden it's... said he, he ordered him to shoot it down on Wednesday and yeah. they shot it down on Saturday? Mm -hmm. And it's like, mm. okay, first of all, I'm not that surprised by that because I know Joe Biden's not running the country, right? right. And this pretty much proves it, so there's that. But the second thing is, how does the president of the United States order the military to shoot a freaking balloon down, all right, and the balloon is not shot down for four days, and all kinds of people are not shit canned? Right. Okay? I don't know how Mark Milley still has a job. Mark Milley thinks he's the emperor of the United States. He thinks he's well, the I military dictator is. of the country. Well, he, maybe he is. Maybe he's not wrong. But yeah. the point is... 
like Mark Milley should have been cashiered after all that crap came out about him. He was talking to the Chinese behind Trump's back and like yep. making sure we don't go to war with China. He should have been. If I'm Joe Biden, I fire Mark Milley for that. Just in the off chance he might do that to me. OK, well, That's that was my point. that was my point about the what's his face, the head of the FBI, because of what happened under Obama. And I'm like, who Obama should have, you know, fired him. But the thing well, Obama's is, Obama's a little different uh, uh, kettle of fish where that's concerned. OK, so remember when I'm going to go back to the Clinton administration. Remember when they oopsie. And the Chinese spy got away with all of the plans for our um, planes and and um, drones. And then during the Obama administration, the oopsie, the OMDB got hacked by the Chinese. And so they knew you mean, everything. Oh, you, mean, you mean OPM? OPM, sorry. Right, I'm sorry. 22 million federal employees. Or yeah, all the federal employees. Like that, all their data that goes to the Chinese. Yeah. And now we have this. So like every it's it's just kind of miraculous how during Democrat administrations, the Chinese who are paying the Democrats, who are sleeping <laughs> been with the Democrats, the Democrats since 1992, by the way. Right. And who are were who have cultivated deep and by deep. I mean, not too. I can't imagine. But anyway, um, Swalwell deep uh, relationships. You know, here we have the the whole of of the party um, in bed metaphorically, and and having another tragedy, foreign policy wise, happen with the Chinese under their administration. And you know, to McCarthy's credit, he got these um, you know sellouts off of the intelligence. You know, but who knows if that makes a difference if our military apparatus, if Milley himself is colluding with the Chinese to give the Chinese what they want. I mean, these oh. is, this is the guy who who um, oh, and, and, and you well, shouldn't assume that the Democrats who did make it on the House Intelligence Committee are not just as bought off by the Chinese oh, right. just as, as, you know, uh, um, yeah. receptive to the idea of treason as, you know, as as Swalwell. And I mean, Schiff. And Schiff. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like, you know, but having said that, there is value in the churn, right? Like, as you notice, I don't mind mm -hmm. playing whack-a-mole as we find these guys, you know, yeah. needing to be booted off these committees. You boot them off. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make the committees better, but at least you're doing something to inform the public that, yeah, we do care about this. Right. Well, and it makes it a little bit harder because, you know, these guys have cultivated extensive uh, relationships and everything. And I, I was like, yeah, I've, I mean, what's Schiff's value to anybody anymore? And same way with Swalwell being booted off these committees, you know, now all of a sudden they're and expendable. Yet, you know, and yet, uh, you know, my guys in California keep telling me, oh, Adam Schiff's going to win that Senate seat. Probably. Like, yeah. I can't. I can't even. I can't even imagine that there's not some, you know, Mexican that's going to pop up out of nowhere and beat this guy. Like, I can't even imagine that Adam Schiff, as obnoxious and disgusting as that guy is, with the with the shady friends that he has, his buddy. Yeah, but look who he's replacing. What's that? Look who he's replaced. Who would, he would be replacing? He's replacing Die Fi, which yeah, is and and she has which is China mobbed up. I mean, I right. get it. I mean, I mean she's, she was actually the first one to be all mobbed right. up with the Chinese, like long yeah. before Swalwell and all these other mm -hmm. ones. I mean, she was pals with um, um, uh, Zhang Zemin when he was the mayor of, of Shanghai, and she did all kinds of dirty deals with him when she was the mayor of, of San Francisco, her and her husband, and they made millions and millions and millions of dollars yep. doing crooked deals with the Chinese back in the 90s. Her oopsie um, having a spy yeah, who, right, who was her driver, her driver for 23 like, years. Right. Oops. I mean, you know, and the idea that she had no idea. Right. Like, oh, wow. That's really unfortunate because I didn't know. Bullshit you didn't know. Of course she right. didn't. It was part of the right. deal, right? Right. Like that was part of the deal. They give you all. I mean, this is how everybody who's ever done business with China will tell you that this is exactly how this works, right? right. Which is, sure, you can have that contract. 
this is our list of, you know, of demands. Demand. And it's very similar to these recording artists that, oh, you want to make it big? Right? Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Robert Johnson at the crossroads. I'll give you all the songs, but I get your soul in response. And that's right. what the Chinese have done to all of these people. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the Republicans are clean in this and the Democrats are not, because, you know, and you're in Houston, Melissa, you yes. can probably tell us all about the Bush Center for, uh, what is it, U.S. China, Bush Center for U.S. China relations that Neil Bush runs, which is the, like, it's even worse than anything I've ever seen with the Democrats, okay? And I mean, Neil, Neil Bush, the, the former president's brother, is as mobbed up and owned by the Chinese mm -hmm. as anybody in American politics. And maybe second is Mitch McConnell. So like, let's not make this at some kind of partisan thing because it ain't. This no, is it's not. a no. rolling establishment thing and our people are compromised across the board. Yeah. So I, I guess we expect more uh, Chinese balloons, more surveillance. And, and, and then, of course, like Ted Cruz had a good point about this, saying, you know, here we have TikTok, which is essentially Americans giving the away their data. You don't need the balloons. Right. I mean, like, really, you, 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 TikTok maps out all of American society. Mm -hmm. OK. And like everybody's screaming. Get off TikTok. Don't put that on your phone. Oh, no, it's fine. And it's like, oh, my God, do you have to end up in a freaking gulag? Do you have to make Nikes for slave labor before you finally get it? Yeah. Get off this thing. It's a stupid social media app. There's nothing about TikTok that's different or better than any of the other ones that are not owned by the communist Chinese. And these people are just like, on their phone. And it's it's, you know, it's. I think Something so that I don't think it's just to TikTok to, to shake people out of this. Right. And I, I'm not going to say it's the good news, but the inevitable news is that something terrible or some things terrible are coming. They're coming. Well, they're here. I think, I mean, like I was looking at the, uh, a number of CIA and FBI and foreign spies, like at Twitter on Facebook, at sure. Google, they're everywhere. Absolutely. And the thing is, is our um, tech gurus are such citizens of the world, including Elon Musk. I mean, he's got a big, um, you know, plant over in China. That means the Chinese have all of his tech and every, all of the things that he can do, they have. Yeah. And so, you know, this th these guys don't believe that America is better or should be in any way um, given preferential treatment. And so they don't, and so they'll sell out the American well, citizens, their buyers I'll, I'll information. I'll put a little hope on Musk, okay? Because mm -hmm. I, I think he's beginning to get it. Maybe. Uh, but like, you know, and, and there's now the rivalry is Musk and Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates is, I mean, you want to talk, that Bill Gates is the enemy. Okay, I mean, like, really, this guy is uh, he, he is starting to become as bad as the Klaus Schwab's and the George Soros's of the world. Um, well, how many times did he go to Scotland? like Epstein Island? Like, oh, yeah, hundreds of yeah. times or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah, I, reg I regret that. I should have been more careful about who I hang around with. I'm like, what? <laughs> what did you do on the pedophile island there, Bill? Did you play chess? Like, I mean, like, why don't you yeah. account for your time, right? I mean, it's just, it's so it's so ludicrous, and the guy is so arrogant that he, you know, he says, but it's not even that. And I mean, certainly that's a symptom of the the lousy character of this guy, and everything that you know Melinda has said about him is is not very complimentary. But it's more than that. It's you know he's he's he shorts Tesla. Right. And he makes his whatever it was, 15, 20 million dollars short of Tesla. And he, he says he did it because Elon Musk kind of re rebuffed him when uh, when, you know, he said, oh, you should you know, you should help me vaccinate all of the, you know, the kids in Africa and all this kind of stuff. And Musk is like busy. I don't you know. That's your deal. It's not mine. Mm -hmm. um, and like now he does this. He goes on BBC three or four days ago and he's like. 
well, you know, Elon says he's going to Mars and that's expensive and he should spend that money to do this. And the idiot from BBC is like, you know, nodding his head. I'm sitting there going, like, who are you? Like this rich, fat, effeminate, man boobs jackass is going to sit like this billionaire is now going to tell another billionaire what he can do with his money when the other billionaire like dropped 45 billion dollars to set twitter free when he's building spaceships to go to mars he's like i mean he's you know I, i'm not everything musk is doing is great like open ai gives me the heebie-jeebies okay right. but it's you know he's at least trying to do technology that could conceivably make human life better right here's an idea though i mean i, I don't wanna... like it but I'm just saying, you could look at that and you could say, well, there's applications that'll come out of this that will be good. Well, okay. Before, be before we get to Elon, uh, you know, Elon Musk is something else. Bill Gates is another thing entirely. You know what I think the secret about Bill Gates is? Is that he's stupid. I don't think he's that smart. He's and I, I actually think that Elon Musk is a genius. Yes. And so, like, so I've read one of Bill Gates' books back in the beginning like you're, you're aware that bill gates didn't write that book right well i'm not sure it's like his first one first or second i'm not sure who ghosted but it's like the worst writing it, it sounds in the writing stilted like he talks it's a little strange so i'm not sure about this okay but it, it's something like I don't know. It's a blue cover, something about, I think I'm like one, the only person in America who bought the book and I actually read it. And I was going through a phase where I was reading like all of the different, um, you know, kind of business books, you know what I mean? Like good to great and you know, all that stuff back. And, and I read uh, three of Trump's books too. Um, Art of the deal, art of the comeback and one other one. But anyway, his books actually were useful. He actually, for the business types who are interested in negotiation, it's actually good. Are the, are the deals terrific? Yeah. Okay. So, but Bill Gates' book was, if he had any hand at all in writing it, it certainly sounded like his voice when you read it. I was like, holy crap, this guy's an idiot. And so, because like you would think that he'd have a better ghostwriter, right? Like, I mean, somebody who could complete a sentence. I don't know. It was awful. And I was like, what if the deep secret here is that he's just a moron? Well, he's a, he's a, you know, he's a computer nerd. It's all he, I mean, it's, you know, he's, he's surrounded himself with some really good people. Yeah, okay? that I believe. Um, but basically, Microsoft didn't invent a whole lot of stuff. Microsoft went out and acquired, you know, brilliant things that other people were doing. Right. And put them in, you know, in this bundle of things that they were able to market right through basically ruthless assaults on the on the the early tech marketplace yeah but like i mean the worst software on my computer is microsoft software mm -hmm. always the buggiest crap you'll ever i mean like you know and you you'll never be able to convince me that microsoft doesn't create the viruses right. that that right. assault microsoft software i mean you, you're never going to tell me that they don't because like, oh, we have a fix for that. And it's like, of course you did. Right. And now this guy wants to get into vaccines. And I'm like, well, well he does until he does. Virus king of computers. So why wouldn't you be the virus king of humans? So he's especially when he's a Malthusian who wants less people on the planet. I don't want medical help of any kind from a guy who wants less people on the planet. Call me crazy. I think yeah. that's risky and not a good idea. Well, he sold all of his uh, um, positions in the different vaccine manufacturing companies. And then like two weeks later, which was like last week or the week before, was talking about how they're worthless and don't do anything, MR the mRNA technology. Right. So, so he sold his positions and then afterwards said it didn't do anything. After he made, I think, $323 million or something. I mean, he probably is probably a short in there somewhere. Yeah, probably. And the thing of it is, is this is not Bill Gates's idea. This right. is some guy that works for Bill Gates. He's like, oh, here's how we can make a whole lot of money. 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, he's pretty crafty. Well, okay. So tonight is the State of the Union. We're we're talking right during the State of this Union. What what do you think? Are we missing something really insightful and important? No, what we're missing is, I mean, I could be proven wrong, like instantaneously, but what we're <laughs> missing would be my guess is Joe Biden reciting a litany of the last two years, how wonderful a president that he is and how you people just don't appreciate him for his brilliance and, you know, resolute uh, vision for the country. Um, and uh, uh, then he will uh, proceed to lecture uh, House Republicans on how much damage they're going to do by mm -hmm. not um, uh, passing all of the things left in Joe Biden's agenda. And that'll be a, sp a state of the union. How coherent uh, it's going to be with the stuttering and the, and the losing one's place and can't read the teleprompter and making a general ass of himself. Like, my guess is that, that there'll be, you know, a little of that early and a lot of it late as, you know, it's like Sundown Joe's time to go to bed. They'll, they'll amp him up with amphetamines. He'll be out. Yeah, he'll but be those fine. we are off though, because, you know, he gets tired and then it kind of just ooh, goes to hell. Well, I saw McCarthy was interviewed about and he said that, no, he was not going to tear up the speech like Nancy Pelosi did. And I went, you know, that... um State of the Union that Trump gave, where Nancy Pelosi was just psycho, and um, yeah, it wasn't just tearing up the speech. She was no, she she was doing all kinds of weird on. things yeah. with her hands, like mm -hmm, you know, like oh, I was like, "What do you? This lady's crazy." Um, but anyway, creep. I I don't know. Like, I think that all of these geriatric people they're losing their social inhibition and their frontal lobes are having are atrophying, and. I think it's the perfect metaphor for their voters. <laughs> so I, I just am like, I don't know what's happening. It's not good. And I don't expect anything good out of Biden. Um, I now, just, this is going to be an entirely forgettable state of the union speech. I mean, most of them are at the end of the day, you know, it's just, it's, it's a self-congratulatory thing. It's turned into a partisan speech. Um, and, you know, wh whoever the next president is, you know, if it's Trump or if it's DeSantis or whoever it might be, I think what would be really good is if they said, OK, here's the thing. For the next two years, I'm not giving the speech. I'm going to give you the written portion of it. I will we'll file it in the congressional record and I'll go, you know, give a speech somewhere or whatever. But I'm not going to do State of the Union because mm -hmm. we need a break. If, if, if the next president would say that. I think the whole country would be like, thank you so much, right? Because this has become a chore for the American people that are <laughs> supposed to watch this. And it's awful. It's an hour long, you know, just- It's like the Grammys. Thing. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I mean, wouldn't surprise me if there are BDSM dancers and like, you know, some dude in a horn hat. It wouldn't <laughs> surprise me if they trotted that out. They've no, they'll unattended in that direction lately. So- yeah. Um, I, you know, I just, to me, I, I think it's a forgettable thing and, you know, it's no longer a necessity to pay attention to, um, you know, I mean, you know, who knows something groundbreaking might be happening as I speak, but I doubt it. I doubt it too. Well, on that happy note, uh, follow us, subscribe, share the whole bit. Scott, as always, thank you very much yeah, for your absolutely. insight. This has been fun. Yes, it has been. And we'll be back next week talking about more of what's going on. We didn't even get to, and there's not much to say, but, you know, keep the people of Syria and Turkey in your prayers. And, you know, if you can find a legitimate organization to give to, boy, those people are in bad shape. But the, I mean, I think right now the numbers are over 7,000. It's probably far, far more than that have died in these you know, massive, um, massive earthquake. yeah, massive earthquake. So hopefully, um, you know, pray just they find as many people as possible. I, I, I can't stand it, you know, Scott, the videos and stuff, but I did watch one where they saved this child and, you know, the trauma and everything. But anyway, um, let's hope that as many people as possible get out of that and are saved. 
and uh, be thankful for what we do have. We might have a Joe Biden in the White House, but, you know, knock, knock on wood, we're all doing fairly well here in America right now. No, no national natural disasters happening for the moment. And that's a nice um, uh, break. So thank you all for um, being here, for listening, joining the spectacle. I encourage you to go over to the American Spectator. If you don't subscribe, please know that your subscription is not just for the print magazine and, and free access to the website, but also you're really helping us pay writers like Scott and um, all the other phenomenal people we have at the site. So please, if you're um, if that's important to you, if you are one of the people complaining about the lack of conservative content or the bias in the media, then hopefully you will help us. And so for those of you who are, who are subscribers or foundation members, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We hope that you'll subscribe here and like and share our um, content everywhere. And that will help us too. So thank you all and have a great night. See you guys.